Hello and welcome to News Clip. Today we have with us Mr. Igor Bosk of the ILO for South Asia uh, joining us to talk about migra migration and migrant labor. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Igor, could you please tell us a bit about the current international climate regarding migrant labor? It's always important to look at uh, uh, migration in the context of uh, where the jobs are and why people are migrating. Uh, so uh, in um, uh, recent history, as you would have seen, there's been a significant uh, uh, amount of migration happening around the world. Uh, uh, in different types of directions, but often uh, approximately uh, close to 60, uh, one, two thirds of the migration is actually for work, which means that, uh, that people are looking, f looking for uh, normal uh, livelihood opportunities, um, that they are not able to meet the, those um, needs back at home, and uh, they need that type, those types of opportunities in places of uh, where they uh, go. And so the challenge here is, you know, how is it that uh, this migration um, can uh, actually be empowering? Uh, and that means basically uh, how are the working conditions for the migrants and what can be done in order to um, um, to improve the outcomes uh, for uh, the lives of, uh, of migrant workers. So um, there's been talk about the, the global compact uh, for uh, migrants, or I'm not very sure on the exact terminology, but could you shed some light on that? Sure, there's a, um, in uh, the last couple of years, um, the, there's been a lot of discussions about trying to come up with some sort of a global compact on uh, migration. Um, and uh, there's been uh, lots of negotiations, particularly recently. There's already a first draft, there was a zero draft, uh, now there's a first draft. Um, and so there's going to be this document that is going to be a legally non-binding uh, framework. However, um, in, in a context where there have been limited instruments looking at uh, migration, um, uh, such uh, an agreement is very important because it will start shaping uh, the way policymakers uh, start uh, looking at uh, mobility and, uh, and uh, uh, labor migration. Um, and uh, it is all the more important because uh, currently that particular draft is still, um, is still uh, of course, a draft, um, but there, uh, there is um, uh, there is still a lot that can be done to uh, ensure that uh, uh, the link with uh, employment is actually represented so that migrants can actually uh, find uh, the types of opportunities that are necessary and that the, the document doesn't look at, uh, at migration as an objective per se. Uh, if there are enough working opportunities that are decent, um, uh, then of course migration will tend to be uh, much uh, uh, easier and uh, regular. However, if the working opportunities are, are, are not as good, then of course there will be more irregularity and therefore it is very important to look at decent work as, a, uh, as an objective um, that has to be well uh, um, articulated in uh, this uh, document. In the context of uh, South Asia, uh, is, is there a, uh, in terms of the out-migration and in-migration, uh, which uh, side does uh, the migration tend to favor? South Asia is uh, uh, by far uh, one of the, the biggest uh, uh, migrant sending regions in the world. Uh, and it also is, the biggest receiver of remittances. Um, uh, so remittances play a, a very important role, uh, especially for the livelihoods of people who are migrating and, um, and their families back, uh, back in their uh, home countries. And therefore, um, this is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, very important that this, uh, these types of agreements like the Global Compact actually represent as well the interests of um, countries that are sending migrants abroad. Uh, and part of the uh, motivation uh, behind the, uh, this global compact is coming from countries that are developed and that are seeing um, um, a rise in, um, a rise in uh, uh, political trends where um, 
where politicians don't necessarily look at migrants uh, in a positive way, as a result of which um, it is important to also uh, look at you know, the working conditions of migrants. So if migrants are actually going to countries uh, um, for different reasons, then what can be done to actually uh, uphold uh, international labor standards? And uh, are there protections, I mean international labor standards, meaning uh, protections for uh, migrant labor in say other countries? There, there are um, uh, uh, labor standards for migrant workers. Um, uh, now, one of the challenges is that many of the countries where, of destination where migrants go in, in, and work to as in majority have not necessarily ratified uh, those conventions. However, there are fundamental principles and rights at work, uh, which are part of the International Labor Organization's uh, standards. And, um, and, uh, and those have certain principles which are um, were supposed to be universal um, and apply even for countries that have not necessarily ratified. And those include uh, issues like, for instance, the freedom, uh, uh, freedom of association, uh, the, the right to collective bargaining and, um, and organizing, uh, uh, freedom from discrimination, um, uh, freedom from forced labor and child labor. Those are fundamental uh, pre principles that are, are very important uh, to uphold in order to ensure that uh, the uh, working conditions improve. Uh, so uh, in the case of, say, countries of origin, uh, I mean, what steps can a country of origin take to ensure the protection of its uh, citizens who have migrated? The most uh, the most important thing is is you know uh, countries of origin uh, have a better uh, bargaining voice when they uh, talk as a uh, as a group. It's and so um, if uh, countries like for instance of South Asia uh, and of the region they uh, talk uh, in one voice with uh, countries of uh, where migrants are going to, then of course that is different. Uh, now what tends to happen is that there is a, a series of uh, of bilateral agreements or memorandums of understanding between different countries, which um, which leads uh, countries to have different uh, types of agreements on how uh, their migrant workers are protected or not. And so you will have um, uh, certain, uh, a hierarchy of, a certain hierarchy of uh, migrant workers who will be often doing similar types of, uh, of jobs in destination countries and yet the, for instance, wages or the working conditions would differ not because of the qualifications that they have but because of the color of their skin, because of their gender and those are the types of things that uh, um, international labor standards are useful for uh, addressing uh, and that's why we're, uh, we try to advocate for, for that. So in the context of South Asia, uh, what steps have, say, some of the governments are taken uh, in regards to protecting their citizens who have migrated? So, I mean, there are a variety of instruments that are used by different, uh, the different governments. Uh, um, I India has an Emigrant Act that uh, from 1980, I think, uh, 83, if I am correct, uh, to be verified, uh, many uh, the Nepal passed uh, recently in a Foreign Employment Act. Uh, the uh, Bangladesh has a similar uh, type of a mechanism. Uh, now. Uh, uh, legislation, of course, is important, but um, what is uh, particularly also important is to make sure that there are uh, mechanisms in place in the countries of destination through uh, embassies uh, uh, that enable uh, workers, uh, migrant workers, to uh, to protect uh, their uh, th themselves and uphold their th their labor rights, uh, so that they they don't f find themselves in these types of uh, uh, discriminatory working conditions. So that is a uh, that is something which can always be improved and we um, in the ILO work in countries of destination with uh, different uh, constituents including trade unions and employer organizations as well as governments to try to uh, improve that. So does the ILO also uh, look into the concerns because from various countries there are concerns about illegal migrants who are snatching away the jobs as the common refrain but uh, is the ILO also I mean, does the ILO's guidelines also look into the working conditions of these illegal migrants? Because like you had earlier said, if the opportunities exist back home, they wouldn't really travel. Absolutely. And uh, the, the working conditions are the, the, 
uh, one of the main sectors which, uh, which the ILO uh, focuses on. I particularly looking particularly at the issue of, uh, of vulnerability to uh, forced labor and uh, um, in connection with that the, fund the other fundamental principles and rights at work. Um, and uh, so, for instance, uh, to give a practical example, uh, I, I, we do work in countries of destination specifically on the working conditions of domestic work, the working conditions of garment workers, uh, and other types of workers. Now, each sector has a very different uh, dynamic, and so it's important to, un to understand that dynamic. For instance, there's a lot of uh, discussion around domestic workers and the rights of domestic workers and their working conditions. However, uh, what is often uh, not understood is why is it that there's an increasing demand for domestic workers around the world? Uh, um, uh, uh, that happens in countries uh, like in the U.S., uh, in Europe, but um, in West Asia uh, as well as in the main cities of uh, India and, and other countries of, uh, of South Asia. Um, and th the reason for that is that you do have, um, uh, you do have, first of all, um, uh, uh, you, uh, a pattern of. Uh, urbanization that's happening uh, that is related with an agrarian crisis uh, in most countries. Um, uh, you have uh, uh, an urban uh, middle class that needs, uh, increasingly needs uh, to uh, rely on some type of uh, assistance uh, in the households. And that is often linked to a certain degree into the uh, city's capacities to provide for certain services. If there is good transport, if there is good uh, health care service, if there are good um, child care facilities, if, if all those types of services are, are there, then of course households have less of a need to, uh, um, to rely on domestic workers. However, if uh, funding uh, for some type of services diminishes, then of course those, uh, the burden um, of the cost falls on uh, the households and therefore there's an increase in, uh, in the demand for domestic workers. And so uh, that is one of the primary reasons of looking at that. So there are uh, all these economic connections which are important to uh, um, understand and, and grapple. Uh, otherwise, simply addressing, uh, you know, particularly the, uh, the, the rights of domestic workers is not enough. Of course, it's very important. There is a, the ILO does have a convention for domestic work, which is convention uh, is Convention 189 uh, that is uh, that guarantees de decent work for 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 domestic workers, um, but uh, you know it should the the labor standards should be seen as a as a comprehensive framework um, that uh, have to be uh, uh, analyzed uh, from different social economic angles. You did mention uh, in the con in this context uh, about internal migration as well, so. So you would say that the external mi factors for external migration and internal migrations are almost the same, or is there a difference? There, there, there are differences, but there's a lot of uh, also similar dynamics. I mean, in the, um, there, uh, as, as I mentioned, it's important to understand why migration is happening. And, and migration is often happening because there's a process of economic transformation that's happening in uh, countries where and areas where people are migrating from, where there's a complete transformation of the type of agriculture that was there. Uh, the, the rural economy that was there is changing and uh, the, the traditional means of livelihoods are no longer working. As a result of that, people end up migrating. And in South Asia, you still have very low, um, uh, very low levels of urbanization compared to some other parts of the world. Uh, so you can expect a certain continuation of this type of, of flows from urban, from rural to urban uh, areas. Uh, so what's important to uh, to look at is how is it the agrarian crisis, for instance, is uh, is uh, affect can affect uh, working conditions in cities of destination, uh, whether it's in uh, within South Asia or whether it's in 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 other countries, or for instance, in West Asia, where many uh, migrants from South Asia go to. And uh, so the more you have migrants flowing into these areas, 
the more, of course, you're going to have also an economic pressure uh, uh, and a depression of, of wages and working conditions can be affected, which gives rise to also sometimes xenophobic, xenophobic types of feelings about why all these people are coming into our cities, why they're coming into our countries from uh, people that we have never seen uh, before. So, um, it, and, and that is why it's important for, um, for policymakers to uh, look at the connection between what's happening in the um, uh, agrarian context with the working conditions in the uh, emerging uh, sectors, often related to the service area or to manufacturing, in this process of structural transformation that's happening. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Igor. And thank you for watching NewsClick. Keep watching our videos. <laughs>